why don't we carry on from where we left off last time. Uh, Jennifer, why don't you take this case? Um, here we just have a single coronal T1 image. It looks like there's some increased signal along the peripheral aspect of the TFC disc, which is concerning for a peripheral tear. And then we're back one slice. Uh, we can see that there's also increased signal there extending posteriorly. Um, and then here on the stir images, it looks like we can't see it quite as well, but there's some increased signal in that ulnar styloid attachment of the TFC. Um, okay, so we have um, coronal images of the, the wrist. There's um, some, in the middle picture, there's some increased signal there at the uh, base of the styloid process. Okay, so this is a T1, a stir, uh -huh. and a T2. Mm -hmm. uh, a grating echo, I'm sorry, a grating echo, T2 star. And we can see the peripheral tear here. Yeah. So that's also an insertion of tear. Okay. Uh, Michael. Okay, so 30-year-old professional tennis player, ulnar wrist pain for several months, with progressive worsening, moderate distal grid to ulnar instability. And so it looks like this is an arthrogram, and we can see that there's contrast throughout the mid-carpal row as well as extending into the distal radial ulnar joint. It looks like on just the T1 that set images that there's maybe a laminar, a proximal laminar defect, and that's where the contrast is getting to the distal radial ulnar joint from, from a ulnar side of TFCC tear. Yeah. And here are the sagittal images. What do they show? Uh, they show the perforation within the TFC. Okay. And so here, this was an upper laminar tear, uh, which we can see here kind of a, a 1B. And then uh, uh, here we, you can see the tear here, kind of a diagram of the tear and evidence of the tear in an arthroscopy. Okay. And here again, you can see the upper laminar tear right in through here. All right. um, so here we have a 26 year old with post traumatic pain, and we can see a remote appearing ulnar styloid avulsion fracture. Um, and it looks like those lower laminal attachments attached to that ulnar styloid avulsion fragment. Now it's not at the base of the ulnar styloid, so this may be considered stable, but there is some fluid in the DRUJ, and it looks like there's some cyst formation in the ulnar proximal triquatrum. So what, what you have here is the distal or the lower laminar fibers are attached to this bone, but this bone is unstable. And the upper laminar fibers or the foveal attachment is torn, so this would be an unstable uh, lesion. And we can also see probably a scaphalunian ligament there are some uh, bone injuries over here on the other side from the acute trauma uh, as well. Uh, and then here we can see a lot of fluid going into the distal radial ulnar joint space. We can really see a separation over here. And uh, that was a fracture. Uh, this one is unstable. Even though it's a distal fracture of the ulnar styloid, it's unstable because the upper lamina is also torn. If the upper lamina were intact, then this would be more of a stable fracture. So, on the stir images on the right, uh, I'm seeing fluid around the TFCC. I'm not, and I'm seeing also some fluid in the distal. Um, uh, radial ulnar kind of joint, just that's that space there. Um, 
could be indicative of a tear, but um, there is. So is that the lamina there, the medial or the? Okay. So, so this is another low field scanner, T1 gradient echo and stir. And here we can see the disc itself, a normal radial art articulation, but we have really a tear of the laminar insertion to over here with some fluid going into the distal radial inner joint space. And so this is primarily a distal tear. It looks like some of the foveal attaches may still be intact. Okay, Michael. Okay, so we see a lot of kind of fluid, maybe even a little cystic type structure at the null or attachment, uh, the TFCC lamina. So it looks like a tear. And on the T, yeah, on the T1 weight image, it looks like we see just like a defect right there. I don't see any definite continuity of fibers. Yeah, so the other thing you can get with these tears are adjacent cysts. You can call them ganglion cysts if you want, but they, you know they're just uh, uh, cysts adjacent to the tear, probably from fluid from the joint space extending into the surrounding soft tissues, which is contained in, in the cyst. So you can look at these, and these are helpful sometimes at trying to decide whether you're dealing with degenerative change or an actual tear. Okay, so here we can see another fracture of the ulnar styloid process. There is some surrounding marrow edema, so this looks like this may be more of an acute fracture than the other case. Um, and it looks like that is at the near the base of the ulnar styloid. I don't. It, I think the lower laminar attachment attaches to that fragment. I I don't see the upper attachment well either so this would probably be unstable yeah. so this again shows that whether it's a type one or two is in my experience with mr doesn't isn't very good at determining whether it's stable or unstable because in a lot of the type one fractures that i see with mr the foveal attachment of the lamina is torn in which case it's unstable so using plain films as an indication of whether it's stable or not, I, I don't think is a uh, reliable indication. And so uh, almost everyone goes to MR now to help make that determination. Okay. So we'll continue to look at a few more of these. Okay. So let's see. The stir image in, in the middle shows edema around the TFCC at the uh, kind of the ulnar insertion of the lamina. Maybe there's a tear there. Um, there's also some fluid in the distal radio ulnar space, maybe indicative of a, a tear. So again, this is probably a type B. You know, with a low field, we can't really determine whether it's type C or not, not that that's, but which would be the uh, triquetral ligaments that would be torn. Uh, but we can see that this really looks like it's an extensive complex tear of the peripheral attachment of the TFC, maybe some involvement of the disc itself, which is not normal configuration. On the axial images, we can also see that there's some subluxation at the uh, radial ulnar, distal radial ulnar joint space as well, where again, the actual amount is very variable. But, but when you, as I said before, when you get a situation where the center arc of the ulna is really at the dorsal uh, cortex of the radius, then I think that's too far and is, and is abnormal. So this was an unstable peripheral tear of the triangular fiber cartilage. Okay, uh, Michael. It's just some more low fields. Okay, uh, I'm trying to figure out if that right is goes Right next to the ulna, if that's a small bone fragment. Yeah, uh, this actually turns out just to be soft tissue fat here. The soft tissue fat, okay. So then we're looking at the TFCC. So the ulnar aspect of the TFCC looks pretty you know, signal alteration and irregular. And I'm not sure there's definite intact fibers going to the... Yeah. Um, there is an effusion in the distal radial ulnar joint. The radial aspect looks like it's intact, so I'd be concerned for laminar tears. 
So this is what it looked like at arthroscopy, uh, where you can see that this is the tear that you're seeing right here, uh, viewed, viewed arthroscopically, and that's the probe going into the tear. So, so this was a, a, a tear of the, uh, that went into the disc, into the periphery, and they sutured it uh, to try to stabilize it. So this was a peripheral tear at arthroscopy. Okay. Uh, do you have any re results on these, John? Or... Uh, you mean clinical results after they've been uh, uh, yeah. treated? Uh, yeah. I don't. I'm sure the literature has that in it, but but I don't. I don't know. We used to use casts on, in, in these folks. Um, and, and treated them uh, that way clinically. Yeah. And, and stability, uh, you can tell clinically also, um, compared the right to the left, et cetera. Okay. And also on x-ray, you can uh, um, stress uh, x-ray yeah. and see if there's instability. Good. So there are more than one way to, to skin a cat here. Good. But um, before arthroscopy, we didn't operate on these, or at least I didn't. Thanks. Um, so here on the single image, we have a lot of irregularity and soft tissue edema kind of along the peripheral aspect of the TFCC, I'm concerned about the extensor carpi ulnaris. I would want to further evaluate that on the axial images as well as the TFCC attachments. And ulnotriquitral yeah, tear. 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 So this ended up being a surgically a class C lesion. Uh, where there was a peripheral tear. Now the problem that we're having trouble with looking at the TFC here is what's the problem? Well, I don't think this patient is adequately pronated because we don't see all of the ulnar styloid process. Yeah. yeah, this patient was not adequately pronated and therefore it was difficult on the MR scan to actually see the peripheral laminar tear now that this patient had because of the, the positioning that we discussed before. And there's probably a little bit of bone injury here to the radial styloid uh, as well. This was an acute injury. So again, positioning is very important, I believe, in evaluating these. Okay, so I'm seeing some, I think again, as, as with before, I'm not seeing the styloid process. Maybe there's a positioning issue here. Um, but there is some edema um, where this styloid process should be, but yeah, but um, is that the lunotriquitral uh, ligament? Is uh, yeah, right. This is this this we're actually not in the one of the problems here is that we're not in the mid plane of the triangular fibro cartilage here. We're actually polar in this particular cut. And uh, if you go to the sagittal images, what we see here. Uh, some of these are impossible to position, I would think, um, the position that you want because of pain. Oh, so what do you think we're seeing here? Um, well, the, the lunate is, um, is uh, dorsally angulated. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and then we have foreshortening of the wrist right. and a scaphalunate ligament tear here. Uh, so, this was a patient who had trauma. He had a uh, scaphalunate ligament tear, uh, dorsal tilt, foreshortening of the wrist, and actually had a, a, a lunotriquitral tear. And the, the lunotriquitral ligament should be right in through here uh, on this. Uh, actually, this is a VC type pattern. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, right. Yep. This is a patient with chronic rheumatoid arthritis where they got weakening of the ligaments due to the chronic inflammatory disease. 
I, I don't know if these are repairable. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you? I think there is too much disease here for it to be repairable. Yeah, I, I, I've seen a lot of rheumatoids um, surgically, and, and, and the tissues are just not uh, possible to suture. Michael, what do you think of this one? Um, so there's a lot, is this a, first this is a arthrogram, correct? Right. Um, so there's a, doesn't look like, I think that's just fat, doesn't look like there's a, I'm trying to see if that's a contrast in the distal radial ulnar joint or if that's just a fat coming through. This is fat. It's suppressed. Okay. Uh, so then, the at least the radial aspect of the TFC looks normal. There is a lot of uh, fluid at that kind of prestellar recess. So I'm wondering if there's some uh, something abnormal going on there. Um, yeah, that's kind of extending out too much. And in here, but I think the TFCC itself, what didn't I didn't see a discrete TFCC tear. Yeah, so that's right. That the TFCC was okay. Here's the dorsal ulnar triquetral ligament right in through here, and it's very okay. Dry, and we don't see it well there. And this was an ulnar triquetral ligament tear, which led to instability in the clunk that the patient. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> This is a wrist arthrogram, and we can see there's a central tear of the proximal TFC disc, and there's contrast signal intensity extending into the DRUJ. It's a radial side tear rather than a central tear. It's at the radial insertion uh, to the articular cartilage, so this would be a Palmer class D type tear, uh, which we can see through there. I don't see, I haven't seen too many of these in practice. But uh, that's one. Okay. Um, let's see. Hmm. And there's quite. The, I mean, there's some positive ulnar ulnar variants here. Yeah. With and um, the TFCC. I'm not. Hmm. It does seem intact. It does seem attached to. To the to the radius, so but over there, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't. Oh, okay. So so this was a tear, kind of a radial site tear, but it was a partial tear involving the mid and volar aspect, whereas the dorsal aspect was still intact. Michael. Okay, um, so we we do see fluid right there within the distal radial ulnar joint, and we see signal, kind of horizontal signal going through the radial aspect of the uh, the TFCC. So it's kind of a weird configuration, kind of like a transverse tear of the radial aspect. And then I guess maybe there there might be a tear of the membranous portion of the scaphalunate ligament. Okay, just one second here. Okay. Uh, here's the sagittal sequence. Um, so I think we're just kind of, you know, seeing that horizontal cleft through the radial disc, and then so we're seeing this uh, I guess yeah, I mean, there's I guess there's a vertical component right there too. Yeah. So. So this was both a, uh, a yeah, horizontal and a vertical uh, component here of the dorsal aspect of the disc here, right? And scaphalunate ligament tear. This has been the membranous portion, but we can see that there's some diastasis here and a type two lunate. Okay. Um. 
So there's marrow edema and cyst formation within the ulnar aspect of the distal radius and the proximal lunate. And I don't see any of the TFC disc, so I think this is compatible with chronic tearing of the TFC. There's a moderate amount of fluid in the DRUJ and associated degenerative disease. So what happens with chronic instability at the distal radial ulnar joint due to a chronic uh, a TFC tear where you get this developed degenerative disease and the mark separation here shows that you've got a lot of instability. So uh, the other ligaments around the distal radial ulnar joint have all been stretched here uh, due to the chronic tear of the, of the triangular fiber cartilage complex. Okay, so we got um, sagittal views here of the uh, carpal bones. Um, hmm. Or so that would be the would that be the ulna there, mm -hmm. and this is it fusion in the what joint is this? Is that the which joint? Mm-hmm. It's a little bit more fluid than, than normal. Mm -hmm. And there's the uh, vaginal T ones. Mm -hmm. There's some axial images. Is there some um, displacement there of the carpal bones? There's some alignment issue? Well, okay, looking at the TFCC here, um, there's some fluid laminar insertion. Oh, is it the uh, extensor carpi radialis, maybe? Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't know. A Nakamura procedure, okay. So, so what we have here, it looks like there may be a fracture here, but what this is, this is a bone tunnel where they had a uh, reconstruction of the distal radial ulnar joint space. So this is actually the bone tunnel, and there's a graph going into the tunnel here. And uh, here you can actually see the graph coming down, and it goes into the tunnel, and it's fixed to the tunnel here in the ulna. Uh, and here... This is the area where the, the tunnel's located. Here's the graph coming up, up through there. And here we can see this is a graph coming down into the bone tunnel. This is the bone tunnel. So this is a surgical procedure to try to stabilize the distal radial ulnar joint because this patient has a foveal tear and instability of the distal radial ulnar joint space. So this is one of many surgeries uh, that can be done in this area to help stabilize the distal radial ulnar joint space. There are a whole bunch of uh, different tendon transfers that you use or t tendons, uh, parts of tendons for these procedures. Uh, you use them as sutures uh, through uh, holes in the bone, etc. Uh, just about every bone in the, in the wrist can be operated on. It's very interesting, the new procedure, so in, in hand surgery, yeah. it's quite a quite a big difference uh, in the last couple of years versus prior to that time. Great, thanks, John. Okay, let's talk about the first carpal metacarpal joint. It's the second most common site of degenerative joint disease in the upper extremities. Uh, it's due to intrinsic instability of the first metacarpal. Uh, carpal metacarpal joint because there's a at that location uh, and it's also an area where you can get different fractures such as the Bennett fracture and the Rolando fractures uh, and it's the most common site in the upper extremity for surgery for degenerative joint disease because this can be very painful and uh, debilitating since the thumb is so important for function of the of the hand so looking at the anatomy Posteriorly or dorsally here, we see the dorsal uh, 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 ligament here. Here's the 
a posterior oblique ligament, and here's the intermetacarpal ligament uh, over here between the first and the second. So this is really thickenings of the dorsal capsule. On the volar side, you have the uh, anterior oblique ligament, which is one of the more common ones torn, and then we have the capsule here and uh, capsular attachments. And here's the ulnar collateral ligament coming in through, through, through over here. So uh, injuries will take, uh, uh, commonly tear this AOL ligament, which can lead to instability and lateral subluxation of the base of the first uh, uh, with respect to the uh, trapezium. Well, looking uh, uh, kind of the uh, reconstructions here, here's the intermetacarpal ligament, the anterior oblique ligament, uh, the dorsal radial uh, ligament over here, uh, the posterior oblique ligament, the intermetacarpal ligament, and here we have the, uh, the uh, radial side ligament, and here are these, where are these different ligaments. And of course, these are just thickenings of the capsule. <clears throat> but uh, they are fo focal thickenings of the capsule. And typically what will occur would be tears or stretching of these ligaments, uh, especially these two, which can lead to instability. With instability, you, see you develop uh, abnormal trauma to this joint, and then you develop degenerative joint disease. And all of you have seen a lot of wrist MRs now, and, you, and you've commonly seen uh, degenerative joint disease at this location in uh, people. So uh, here's the anterior oblique ligament and the posterior oblique ligament here on the sagittal views uh, where they're locating. It's really just part of the capsule. Here we can see it here on this fat suppressed uh, sequences, uh, the intermetatarsal ligament and the DRL uh, out over here. And the adductor pollicis lung is coming up. Uh, peripheral in this, in this location. So these are the th things we look for. And the typical with degenerative disease, you see the typical things, loss of articular cartilage, subchondrocystic changes, edema and granulation patterns like we see in other areas of degenerative disease. Uh, let's see, uh, I don't know who's last. Uh, Michael, do you want to take this one? Uh, sure. Okay. Um, so acute injury to thumb base uh, that looks like maybe a curvilinear edematous bone fragment, or if I'm getting faked out by soft tissue right there. Right there. Yeah. That's just soft tissue. Uh, okay. So um, but in both those regions, like in the region of the POL and the AOL, the oblique ligaments, there's edema. So it's just kind of quite a bit of diffuse capsular edema and thickening, right. so at least a kind of lower moderate grade sprain. Yeah, this is a pretty high grade sprain of the, uh, of the dorsal and the anterior oblique ligament here, which are the, the capsule in those locations. Uh, you can see it should be a nice thin black line going across the, like you saw before, a thin black line here, but these are tears of those ligaments. And then what are do you Acute John, or, or chronic because of this area, as you know, uh, chronically it, it becomes a bit unstable and, and uh, you get uh, increased uh, degenerative disease. Well, various uh, osteophytes, etc. Uh, it, it's a, a very common joint for a degenerative disease in, in, a, in a human hand. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, you, you see that in almost uh, all, especially uh, females um, uh, over the age of 60. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was an acute injury my guess is it's probably an acute injury on top of chronic underlying degenerative disease of the capsule, but uh, yeah. it was worked up as an acute injury, and uh, we can see those. And then, Michael, what do you see in the axial plane? Um, so I still see signal right where that kind of anterior, is that where the anterior oblique ligament was, but it also looks like there's maybe some muscular edema. 
And uh, that'd be the, uh, I think the. And then acute. Ad vector polycus, maybe. Yeah, that's it, Dr. Policis. Uh, and this is not uncommon in acute injuries to see muscle tears uh, of this particular muscle. Good. Well, we just have a single image of the thumb, but it looks like there may be some cortical irregularity along the ulnar aspect of the base of the thumb metacarpal. So I think this is a mildly displaced ossific avulsion injury fracture. fracture. Mm -hmm. uh, is this a Bennett fracture? Which is, yeah, which uh, is an unstable injury there. Because that's at that's at the capsular insertion of that uh, oblique ligament. Okay, we're seeing um, quite a bit of edema at the base of the thumb, with um, looks like intact. Are those the? Uh, is that the radial? So here's the anterior oblique ligament area uh -huh. of the capsule. Okay. Posterior oblique area of the capsule, little bone edema. Okay. So those are, would be the anterior oblique ligaments and posterior oblique ligaments? Yeah, and so they're twined, right? Mm hmm So this was a, and here we can see edema around that area of tear and a little bit of bone edema that we saw on the coronal images. Mm. And this was a, capsular tear here involving the radiocollateral ligament, but also the anterior uh, and uh, dorsal oblique ligaments as well. Michael? Okay, so uh, right there at the CMC joint, it looks like there's complete disruption of the, well, it's this anterior oblique ligament. Okay. Um, yeah, and it doesn't look like it's in continuity at all with complete fluid cleft around it. And the this probably the the dorsal the posterior oblique or the dorsal looks pretty macerated as well. I don't know if that's just scarring or if those are intact fibers. Yeah, I, I think it's it's really a high grade partial tear with a lot of thickening of that posterior oblique ligament. Uh, I agree with you. And then we can see a lot of edema in the adjacent muscles here as well. Here we can see the disruption of the adjacent muscles. So this was really a high-grade partial tear of the posterior oblique ligament and a complete tear of the anterior oblique ligament and with uh, strains of the adjacent muscles. Good. Okay, we're acute lateral wrist injury. We have two coronal images of the thumb, and there is increased signal intensity diffusely throughout the dorsal oblique ligament and there's also some attenuation of the distal anterior oblique ligament looks like maybe a complete tear or at least high grade so compatible mm -hmm, compatible with capsular injury and surrounding soft tissue edema um, and here we can see fluid and soft tissue edema surrounding the thumb at the cmc joint Eighteen-year-old one. When you say capsular tear, uh, you actually mean uh, all the ligaments are torn with a capsule. Right. So, 18-year-old, uh, one month after trauma, pain and grinding. Um, at the CMC joint, we're seeing um, a lot of edema and irregularity of the uh, capsule, particularly the, uh, that'd be the posterior capsule. And there's also uh, edema in the base of the metacarpal and the uh, trapezium. Um, 
with some displacement there, uh, some radial displacement of the uh, first metacarpal. Um, yeah, there's more more irregularity in the posterior posterior side. That's maybe a complete tear of the uh, posterior oblique ligament. Oh, there's a small bony fragment there. Um, looks pretty well ossified. Maybe it's pretty chronic. So, as you said, the posterior area is oh, subacute. Mm -hmm. So, this is a ligament tear of the bulging fracture of the base of the first metacarpal. It's a lot of soft tissue in the ligament, which you can see. So, Michael. When you say subacute, um, we're talking about anything probably over a, a week or two. Okay. This is one month. That's right. Michael? Michael? Michael, are you on mute? We're missing Michael. Why don't you go ahead and take this from Jennifer? All right, so we have chronic lateral wrist pain. Look, there is thickening and increased signal within the anterior oblique ligament, and there's cyst formation within the the metacarpal base um, and surrounding soft tissue edema. Not sure if this could be some type of inflammatory arthropathy. Okay, so here again we can see the cyst formation and um, joint effusion, surrounding fluid, and it looks like chronic degenerative disease. Yeah, again, the cyst formation, marrow edema, and some cortical irregularity. Okay. So, uh, so there is a staging uh, of uh, degenerative disease uh, in this location. Stage one, you basically got normal configuration or a little mild joint space narrowing. Stage two, this is one plain film. Narrowing on the joint space with osteophytes less than two millimeters, stage three cyst grossest, loose bodies, uh, subluxation greater than a, a third of the of the diameter of the base. Stage four is stage three plus scaphotrapezoidal trapezio trapezoidal osteoarthrosis. Uh, in plain uh, terms. Go ahead, John. I wonder how that helps to treat the patient. Uh, I, I really don't know the answer to that because uh, I've never used this classification. Again, I kind of described the findings, and with MR, we can actually see much more specific information than this, especially early in the disease, knowing exactly which parts of the capsule or ligaments are involved can be helpful because there are surgical reconstructions to uh, to stabilize the joint space early on. Yeah. Once you get into the arthritic process, then you're, you you have few choices as to what to do. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I've never used this classification. I, I bring it up because, you know, as as you know, my feeling about classifications. If you're working with a surgeon who really uses the classification, you need to use the learn the one they use and use it. Uh, but there's so many different classifications out there for for different areas. Uh, like for articular cartilage, there's at least nine different classifications to evaluate articular cartilage. Most of them are described for research purposes, not really clinical purposes. So I, again, as John and I have said all along here, it's better to describe the, the pertinent findings, and then the uh, referring physicians can uh, decide how they want to treat the patient. But there are some people who really like certain uh, classification systems and so if that's you if you work with that particular surgeon then you use the classification system that they like using and this just kind of shows progressive degenerative disease 
with joint space narrowing, a little bit of irregularity of the subchondral bone, more irregularity and then involvement of the triscaphy joint going forward. Well, why don't we stop here and uh, we'll start uh, a new topic tomorrow. Okay, thanks. Any questions? Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks, John. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, on that last case, like it would not unmute my microphone. So I just tried to had to like uh, restart it. Uh, I kind of figured that sure what was going on. So. Great. All right, talk to you later. That's a beautiful top of the mountain. Which one is that, John? Uh, you know, th that's a stock photo from Apple, so I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm not going there, so that's okay. <laughs> okay. All right, everyone. Take care, everybody.